National Recreation Area, um, collecting data for my master's thesis, and today I'm going to be talking to you about some of my preliminary results. So the primary ecosystem that we were interested in for this study is the chaparral ecosystem. Um, a mature chaparral stand has a dense canopy, which limits understory growth, and when fires burn through these ecosystems, they typically travel as a high severity canopy fire, crown fire. Um, so this creates a need for us to protect human communities within those ecosystems. Um, currently, there is lacking data on long-term effectiveness of fuels treatments. Um, we know that the removal of chaparral in combination with disturbances that come from fuels treatments can encourage invasive species spread. So that creates a challenge in finding balance between fuel mitigation and ecosystem integrity. So a little bit of background on my study that I'm working on. This is part of a long-term study that began in 2003. If you're not familiar with where Whiskey Town is, the red, um, the red dot right there is the car fire outline and Whiskey Town is located within that. So the fuels treatments were implemented in either 2002 or 2003, and um, each unit was given one of five treatment types, those being hand thinning, prescribed burning, mechanical mastication, and mechanical mastication with prescribed burning, and the last option was a control for comparison. Um, Post-treatment surveys were done in 2004, and in 2018, uh, tr the treated areas were revisited and resurveyed for their long-term effects on vegetation and fuel loading. And following the completion of the 2018 data collection, the car fire burned through the study site, which created this opportunity for us to come in after the fire and see how the treated areas fared in the face of wildfire. So Eamon just talked about the car fire quite a bit, so I'll just briefly um, go over some of the big details. The fire ignited on July 23rd and burned just shy of 93,000 hectares of land. There were eight fatalities, including both civilians and firefighters, and over 1,000 residences were lost. This fire is currently the eighth most destructive fire in California state history. So my research questions for this study are, one, how does fuel consumption from wildfire vary among treatment types? And two, how do fuel treatment types affect wildfire burn severity? And now I'm going to show you some pictures of the actual fuel treatment implementation process within our experimental site. This first picture is of hand thinning taking place. This option is fairly labor intensive because we bring in fire crews, they thin with chainsaws, and they have to carry the debris outside of the unit and um, in this case, it was burned outside of the experimental area. This is a picture of um, the prescribed burning that took place in Whiskey Town. Um, you can see in this picture that it's a fairly <coughs> low intensity fire burning through the chaparral stand. It's staying, for the most part, as a surface fire. It's not burning through the canopy. Fuel moistures at the time of <coughs> burning were relatively high, so, um, this is different from how it would burn naturally. But. And then this is mechanical mastication. And I like this picture because it shows how dense the stand was before. And if you look at the ground in the masticated area, you can see all of the debris that's been chewed up and spit out by the masticator. And it's now, so it's taken the live shrubs and it's now converted it to dead fuels. So that can um, contribute towards fire behavior significantly. And this is what it looks like um, after it's been masticated and um, we burned it. So the fire intensity, this is with high fuel moisture and um, it's quite a bit more intense than the previous picture that we just saw. Um, so it's important to mitigate these fuels before the wildfires actually come through. So now getting to my uh, field collection methods, um, on the right of this slide is the experimental site, which was about 18.2 hectares. And um, the site was broken up into 10 blocks. Each block was determined by habitat. So 
they were either categorized as oak dominated, chaparral dominated, or oak chaparral mix. Um, the treatment units were within each block, and um, the vegetation plots were within each treatment unit, which is where we actually collected the data. So this is what um, this is an illustration of um, the vegetation plots. So within this, we recorded burn severity, fuel loading. We used the Browns method to record fuel loading. And if you're not familiar with what fine woody debris is, because it's an important topic, uh, fine woody debris is dead branches, twigs, wood splinters, anything from 0.1 to um, 2.9 inches in diameter is what we're measuring and counting. And then we also looked at a shrub transect. So now getting to my results, um, this first graph is live shrub density. And um, so on the x-axis, we've got year, um, year red, so either 2018 or 2019, pre-fire versus post-fire. And on the um, y-axis, we have the mean live shrub density, which is measured in number of stems per meter squared. And um, we did find a significant difference between 2018 and 2019, as we would expect. Um, but then focusing in on the 2018 results, so just a refresher, this is 15 years post-treatment. And what we saw was a significant difference between the masticated and controlled burn units from the control units. And this can be explained by the fact that the control unit has a lower number of larger shrubs and the masticated and controlled burn unit has a higher number of regenerating shrubs because this area was cleared out with mastication and then um, burned. So um, that's why we're seeing higher numbers in those units. Uh, the shrub composition was primarily white leaf manzanita. The second most common was poison oak and the third was toyon. And then uh, looking at 2019, treatment um, was actually not significant. So looking at these results, we can see that the shrub density was essentially leveled and all brought down to that same um, zero to one live shrub density. Uh, the shrub composition changed from uh, primarily white leaf manzanita to now primarily toyon, which is a re-sprouter. So that makes sense that we're seeing high levels of regeneration among toyon, the second most common was still poison. Uh, so fuel loading, um, this is pre-fire, and this is that fine woody debris that I mentioned earlier. Um, again, this is post-treatment, uh, 15 years post-treatment, and we found that treatment unit was significant with a p-value of 0 0.03. And um, within this, the biggest difference from the control was the hand-thinned units. Uh, they were significantly lower than the control unit. So um, those were the most effective at um, reducing fuel loading before the fire. Um, and then post-fire, the results that we saw. So these results are interesting because if you look at the pre-fire versus the post-fire data, um, it almost looks like there isn't a huge difference between fuel loading. And this is explained by the fact that um, all of the live shrubs that were there before are now dead, and those are contributing towards the fuel loading. So if it looks like the fuel loading increased slightly, that's why. Um, all of the treatments in 2019 were significantly different from the control, except for the spring controlled burn unit. Um, we saw noteworthy mastication, or noteworthy consumption in the masticated units. And then um, I decided to break it up by habitat. So uh, this is within the chaparral habitat. We saw low surface fuel loading in the control unit before the fire, which we would expect in a chaparral ecosystem. Again, we saw con significant consumption in the masticated units. So this is starting to be a little bit of a trend. Higher consumption in the masticated units and lower consumption in the hand thinned and spring burned units. And then looking at the oak habitat, um, in comparison to what we just saw in the chaparral habitat, we see an increased pre-fire fuel loading um, in the control unit, which we would expect in an oak habitat. And um, again, we're seeing noteworthy consumption in the masticated units, but also the control units in this ecosystem. Um, again, 
lower levels of consumption in the hand thinned and masticated and controlled burned treatments. So then I was curious to see if uh, the fuel loading and the shrub density would translate into the burn severity at all. And um, so first, this is the vegetation burn severity, which looks at how did the shrubs burn any vegetation that was there. Um, and the scale is from one, which is unburned, to five, which is high severity fire. And I found that treatment was not significant, um, which was not what I was expecting. I thought we would see differences. But looking, even though it's not significant, we can still look um, between the treatments and look for any patterns. And it, the hand thinning unit shows the greatest level of variation, and it kind of dips down the lowest. And then looking at substrate burn severity, again, we see the greatest variation in hand thinning. Um, and the masticated unit also, um, we see the highest level of burn severity. So although for the most part it is a moderate severity fire, it's creeping up to that higher severity fire um, within the masticated units. So that was a lot of results. Just to summarize, um, the shrubs, we saw higher levels of live shrubs in the masticated and controlled burn units 15 years after the fire, but then, or sorry, um, 15 years post-treatment. And then after the fire, we saw very few differences between the post-fire treatment units. Looking at fuel loading, we saw, as we expected, habitat type influenced the fuel loading results and the hand thinning treatments and masticated and controlled burn treatments reduced fuel load and consumption. And the masticated units had the highest levels of consumption generally. And then within the burn severity, so we found that the shrubs and fuel loading didn't really influence the burn severity, which went against our expectations. Um, overall, most of the units burned in a moderate, occasionally higher severity fire. Masticated units showed slightly higher substrate burn severity, and um, the highest level of variation was within the hand thinned units. So these are some variable results that we were seeing, and they went against a lot of our expectations, so that's interesting. And I wanted to show you these two pictures here. So um, these are both pictures from the same treatment type. They're both masticated and spring burned treated areas and they both show really different um, fire effects. So the picture on the right, we see higher burn severity, the live shrub density is zero, um, the, the burn severity in the substrate was also much higher. And then looking at the picture on the left, we see different levels of consumption and um, we see a different vegetation response. So I was wondering why we're seeing such different responses and I came up with two possible explanations. The first being that these were really small treated areas and it's possible that if we um, expanded these treatments to a larger scale we might see um, more effectiveness of the treatments but I don't know that for certain. Um, and then the second explanation which is more likely is that the length of time since the treatment is just too great these were 15 years after the treatments were done, and um, we're seeing that it might not be effective with that much time in between treatments. So um, upcoming plans for this project, I still have one remaining research um, question to answer, which involves looking at the vegetation. Um, the question is, how does vegetation, particularly invasive species, respond to fuel treatment type followed by wildfire? And I also want to examine shrub and tree canopy cover and compare that to the vegetation response. Um, I would like to thank the National Park Service Fire Reserve Fund for funding this project and supporting it. I'd like to thank Caroline Marcherano, Jennifer Gibson, Eamon Amber, and um, I'd like to thank Maddie Lopez for data collection assistance. And I can take any questions. <laughs>